If you're raising a disabled child and you have questions as a parent in regards to how do you navigate the deep and difficult waters, the, the overwhelming resources and opportunities that are presented to you, this is your video. We are meeting with Kelly Coleman, the author of Everything No One Tells You About Parenting a Disabled Child, your essential guide to navigating the questions that many of you watching this video have. Kelly Coleman is a feature film development executive turned author and is active in the disability advocacy community. She serves on committees at the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles, and she has recently written the book that we are very excited to talk about today. Let us welcome to the virtual stage, Kelly Coleman. Kelly, welcome and thank you for being here. Thank you for having me and all that you do. Yes. I am so excited to be in conversation with you. Yes. Not only are you providing like, here's information, but to provide it in a way that is fun, where you are a clinician, but you are also a person who rides a moped and has a boom box in the background that I'm just gonna assume is real. Um, <laughs> We got to figure out how to communicate mm -hmm. with families yeah. so that all of this doesn't feel as troublesome as you said, which was the perfect word, so that we can actually do the things. Before I jumped on with you, I was on the phone with insurance and dealing with the adaptive car seat I've been trying to mm -hmm. get for my son for 11 months. Oh, yeah. I believe it. Adaptive car seats. Um, whether it's, uh, you know, kind of, uh, we, we do a lot with beds and kind of, uh, beds yeah. that kids safe overnight, safe sleepers, all the different cubby beds, all the things yeah. you're probably familiar with. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of things that, that we could talk about, even just right there. That's probably yes. two hours worth of, uh, worth oh of my gosh. Medical equipment is hours worth. And like this, this is why I wrote a book. I have yep. two amazing kids. They're mm -hmm. 10 and 12 and they're goofballs and silly and chase each other and all they're the best of friends our 10 year old has multiple disabilities and so this like adaptive beds and car seats and diaper yep. orders and feeding tubes of, like yep that yep. Is my world yeah. and yeah. nobody knows how to do it yep well you're right who's this guy and, oh <laughs> that's, Aaron. that's our son he is receiving an award um that picture is actually in the book because i love it so much yes and it was an award for digital citizenship and i'm like oh, i don't know what that is but i'm crying because my kid's getting an award yep I and love like he has really learned to use technology in order to open up his world, his communication yeah. is emerging. I'm sure you see so many yep. clients, patients communicate with people all over the place about emerging communicators. And like, can we just agree that every human who does not have full mouth speaking conversation needs access to alternative communication devices? Yes of their preference, whether that is an analog mm -hmm. flip book, if that's what they prefer. Yes. My son has an iPad with a program. In the last year, he went from almost zero proficiency to over 200 words that he is independently communicating with his device. Wow. And that. I'm sure you have so many families where yeah. communication is such a concern Yep. We should not have to fight for access to communication options for our children. And it yeah. is a fight. It is. And you bring up a lot of good points right away because a lot of times what people want to know is, you know, what's the most important next step? You know, what, what would you, if, if we could put anything in place, you know, early yeah. and often, what would that be? And usually, and there's, you're smart. There's a lot of ways to answer that question. But mm -hmm. usually what I say is, listen. The path to independence is paved with the ability to communicate. Okay. Yes. We have to be able because so Aaron, your son has a voice, right? It's a beautiful mm -hmm. voice. He's got thoughts. He's got interests. He's got opinions. He's got people he likes. He's got people he doesn't like. That's right? true. <laughs> and the ability to communicate effectively using an augmented communication device or whatever, whatever mechanism it is, mm -hmm. is, is, um, incredibly Im important. And so 
um, that's a good segue into one of the first questions that I want to, I want to ask you about. And that is, um, I want to hear a little bit about your kids and your journey. Can you tell us a little bit about, and we talked a little bit about Aaron, tell us about your kids and your journey. I can talk about my kids all day. I'm a mom. Uh, before I was a mom, my job was coming up with ideas for talking animal movies, which is a super fun job. And I have no real world skills. So there you go. Um, but segues nicely into me writing a book. Um, yeah. This is a parenting journey that I didn't expect because nobody talks about like disability is just math. It is a thing. Mm that happens yes. and happens often. It is not tragic. It is not, oh, you're an inspiration because you have a feeding tube. No, like he's- Oh, I like this. Kid. I like this. Okay, so say that again. Say that because I've not heard it described like this. So essentially what you're saying is, because we, and this was a question I wanted to ask you, but let's just get it. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is, and again, I want to hear from you is, it's not tragic in the sense that there needs to be an I'm sorry or a, a, or is that, I don't know, I don't want to put words yeah, in your mouth, but so I understand that. But it's also not an opportunity to say you're a hero or that, that you're, explain that. Am I getting that right? You are absolutely getting that right. And okay. I love this conversation. Um, just because someone exists and is going grocery shopping in a yeah. disabled body does, and that includes the brain, um, does not just make them a hero. Like he cheers for airplanes and pokes his brother and laughs at farts. Like that's not <laughs> me. That's the 10 year old dude. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And, okay, um, okay. There, there's this phenomenal Ted talk um, by a woman named Stella Young called okay. I'm not your inspiration. Thank you very much. Who articulates this so oh. much more beautifully than I ever will. Um, largely because she is a disabled person herself. And the whole yuckiness of, oh, you're so inspiring. You exercised, but you have a physical disability. What? Mm -hmm. Nope, I'm a person. And if someone is is doing something that creates, you know, I want to be an inspiration because I've accomplished X, Y, and Z, but it's this weird disconnect. If you're like, wow, this is, this is heroic that your child goes to school. Is it heroic that all kids go to school? Because like he's just going to school huh. and, uh, yes. and, you know, it can create this kind of yuckiness with parents, certainly. And as people get older, um, it's like, oh, you're seeing the disability and then you're projecting all of your weird feelings onto it. So you're not actually seeing me as a person and for who I am. And I would rather people see my child for who he actually is mm. and get to know him. He does communicate a lot. He is a complex communicator that might, his communication might be squealing at airplanes or pointing. He has just a couple of words and sounds, a couple of signs, largely with his communication device. Mm -hmm. uh, let's get to know people as people and learn about disability from disabled people um, rather than just projecting, because, oh my gosh, I spent so many years not learning about disability from disabled yeah. people. And yeah, I'm going to get it real wrong because I'm not actually yeah. learning from lived experience. Yeah, you, there's a lot there. Because it, it, it in the, the field, thankfully, and I, I, mm -hmm. the field of medicine mm -hmm. has changed a lot as it relates to how to have these conversations. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you bring up a lot of, because it's, you know, there's, it's almost like there's levels to it. Like, there's levels in terms of like, you know, I love what you said, like, we're not going to go, you know, a tragedy, but we're not going to go a victory. Mm -hmm. We're just going to, we're going to celebrate who, who you are in the moment, because you're a human, mm -hmm. and you're a person, and here you are. Yes. But, you know, so it's also there. So there's a social nuance in terms of how you approach it from person to person. But there's also a linguistic aspect to this. Yeah. Is it, is it, am I right? Because it's, mm -hmm. and you can see this, you know, with individuals. And there's kind of two that, you know, again, that you see this in a lot of different subject areas. An example would be, in, are you, does an individual have autism or are they autistic? Mm -hmm. Is an individual disabled or do they have a disability? And mm -hmm. again, it's like the field in medicine is kind of swung, you know, we're playing, kind of playing catch up in, in mm -hmm. some of things. Can you, is that, am I getting it right? Like, is there's a, mm -hmm. there's a, there's a personal social approach, but then 
there's a language portion. Can you teach us a little bit? Like how, when you meet people, say a provider or a family member or somebody at the park, how do you, what's the right way from your perspective? Not that, you know, we'll just assume there is a right way or a preferred way. Maybe is a better way to say it. What's your preferred way for them to communicate in regards to Aaron's, you know, situation? So my preferences come from my conversations with disabled adults, teenagers, anybody who have a conversation yeah. with me. So I certainly don't vilify anyone who's like, oh, you you got it wrong, unless you're saying something offensive. And by the way, like, just don't say things that you know are offensive. Um, but I am informed by real life disabled adults. And in my first chapter of the book, it's all about getting comfortable with disability and language is something that I absolutely dig into because it's essential. Language is evolving and disability language is evolving because actual disabled people are leading the conversation, are becoming mm -hmm. creators in a way that was not available in the past. And the word disability is the chosen word saying my kid has special needs or different abilities or whatever euphemism. Not mm. only does that, it gets a little weird because it's like, oh, I can't say the word disabled because that's so bad. Right. Yeah, this is, it, yeah. It is the word that is used in law. It was hard for me to use it first because I yeah. had all of these negative, ignorant ideas in my head that I had. Yeah grown up with the years of, oh, disability must be terrible because nobody talks about it. So we need to talk about it. It's just math, lots of people. And so using the word disability, it's the word that is used in law. It's the word chosen by the disability community is essential. And within that, there is so much very valid conversation on both sides of if we're using person first language or identity first language, yes, yes. person first being person with a disability, identity first, being disabled person. Yes. Ideally, everyone gets to choose and announce which language they Ooh. prefer. I like they this. Create, right? This is so good. Kelly, yeah. this is so good because yeah. you, you've met well-meaning parents who've left yeah. the clinic just like mine mm -hmm. and they received maybe a description or a diagnosis or a point of clarity. And they went on a Facebook page and they typed in the wrong description or whatever it is. Again, it, let's just say they went in and they used people first mm -hmm. or they went and they used, you know, identity first or whatever. Yep. And they said special needs and all the things you're not supposed it to just say. exploded and they felt mm -hmm. even more abandoned. And I love what you're saying. Are you, and I want to make sure I get this. Are you saying that, there's there's arguments to be had. There's discussions to be had on both sides. These discussions, uh, we should take our cues from adults who have li have lived experience in these yeah. arenas. And also, and children who are able and interested in communicating this. Yes, yes. and kind of let the individuals decide for themselves. Yes, and yeah. that is messy. Love that. We're having conversations, yes. and I was like, I'm writing a book. I'm going to get to the bottom of this. Yes. and the reality is. There's no one answer. Yes. There is only yes. allowing language to evolve and following those with lived experience. My book has the phrase disabled child yeah. in the title. Yep. What language do we choose to use for Aaron, who's not yet able to communicate what he prefers? Mm -hmm. And even if he did, he's 10, he might not care. Um, he just, he wants to go like blow bubbles and watch mm -hmm. trucks. Cool. Um, I use both depending on the situation. For the uh, title of the book, the disability is relevant. So I said disabled child. I wanted to claim him firmly as a member of the disability community. That, yeah. in that context, is an important part of his identity. In many conversations, it's not real relevant because we're just talking about him as a kid. And so I might say, kid with a disability, kid with multiple disabilities, I might not even mention it. Yeah. Um, in different circles, there are different preferences. I have spoken mm -hmm. with a number of people with intellectual disabilities who always prefer person with a disability because they're like, man, I get discounted all the time because I'm disabled and I want language to reflect 
me as a person yes. before anything else. Mm -hmm. I've talked to a number of people who identify as autistic who say always autistic person, never a yep. person with autism. Yeah. Yep. Um, and we can great if there was just one size fits all, but that's not how people work. Mm -hmm. And so we need to honor what people are choosing for themselves. I don't get to pick. I am not disabled. So it's none of my business. Yep. And I hope my kid will one day be able to correct me with my language. Yeah. But I have chosen to use both within the book and within our lives based mm -hmm. on the situation. Um, when we are online, the internet can be a lifeline as it has been for us. Mm -hmm. It can also be just a mess. Uh, <laughs> I don't get all up in people's business if yeah. it's about language, if, yeah. unless it's offensive, then welcome. Yeah. Uh, but having these conversations, it is all, always okay for you to say, I said this before, I have new information and I am now doing something different yes. by the way, in all aspects of our lives. Um, gather information, listen, and pay attention to what are safe spaces for you to engage and have conversations to ask questions. If there's a page where people are jumping all over each other in a really gross way, yeah, engage there. If right. there's a space where you're able to say, I knew I'm going to get this wrong. I'm in the process of getting it right. We're all going to get it wrong. We're all in the process of getting it right. Um, engage there instead. Mm. And if you get it wrong, because you will, hmm. own up to it and say, I'm going to take this opportunity to learn something and to do better. Yeah. Because the name of the game is we are honoring our children as full individuals. And when disability, or frankly, when our kids have any identity that we don't share, be it disabled or anything else, um, we have a learning curve and view that as exciting and a point of curiosity instead of like, oh, this is the thing. We'll see. I love it. I like how you say we're all in the process of getting it right. Like yes. I, I love that we're all falling forward and we're doing our best and, and it's, it sounds like there's situations where one over the other, but this is, that's actually a really refreshing approach because I think oftentimes we're led to believe that it's what it has to be one way. And my experience clinically is no way. It's no way. Is it just one way? It depends a lot on what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. Let me ask you, how about this? Okay. So this is, I thought is a good question because again, like, you know, I think I know the answer to this just by spending time with you and listening and, and, you know, the, what I do know about um, the content, I know it's excellent, but from your perspective, why do parents need this? Like what, right. Isn't there enough? Let's just play. Isn't there enough information on the NIH or the blah, blah, blah website? I mean, isn't there something else out there that they can, they can use to teach us a little bit about, I think they need it. I think it's awesome. But tell me from your perspective. Yes. So I was doing this for, for my son, for our family, yep. for a decade, more than a decade before this book existed. Can it be done without the book? Of course it can. It took me a decade and walking away from career and mm. so many hours, so much wasted time and money and stress. Um, can you do it without the book? Of course you can. I hope you have a decade and all the leeway to get it wrong that I took because, man, I got mm. it wrong for so long. Um, we are reinventing the same wheels. Someone has done this before you. This book is not a here's how to do everything and it's magically fixed. There is no one solution. Wouldn't that be nice? It is here. Here's the foundational information you need. What worked for us? interviews with experts, letters from fellow parents, bullet points, worksheets, templates, all of mm. this stuff, questions to ask yourself where to start so that you can build this journey for yourself. I am yeah. partial to books because they are not the endless rabbit hole that the internet is. Um, yeah. I sourced yeah. so many experts in this. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not working at high levels in disability justice but people I interviewed for the book are. And 
we need to view caregiving as a job. It is a job in addition to parenting. And if we are able to get practical about the stuff, you know, there's a chapter on insurance and government benefits, financial planning and future care plans, working with your medical team, therapies, IEPs, like yes. and lots more. Yes. Um, it's let's stop reinventing the same wheels. And so many parents, when they're delivered a diagnosis, it, I'm going to assume you're awesome at it. It is sloppy. It is awkward, it is uncomfortable. And it is with so much pity and no path forward. And, you know, I have to Ooh, say I like that. all pity, no power. You know what I mean? Oh my gosh. Thank you. I like what you're saying there. I mean, it's, it's, it's really helpful because you're right. It's all pity and no power. There's like mm -hmm. a, a description, right? A diagnosis is it might give you a, a, maybe a path or a little clarity, but the most important thing in our clinic that we emphasize, certainly there's value in, in, in understanding what's happening, but it's, what are you going to do? Yeah. Like, what, what are you going to do about this though? Like, mm -hmm. and so I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just got yeah, no, I love that. And this is why I love talking to clinicians so much because we can put the parent perspective and the clinician perspective together yeah. so that this is easier on everyone, including the clinicians. Um, it was my second chapter is all about diagnosis, and it was so important to me to dig into that. Our son has a yet undiagnosed genetic yeah. syndrome, yeah. so it has been an odyssey and continues to be. And within that, has been diagnosed with autism, epilepsy, cerebral palsy, cortical vision impairment, has a feeding tube, sensory, yeah. behavioral, intellectual, uh, fine motor, gross. Like he's just an overachiever and he's like, cool, I'm going to check all the boxes. So we've had a lot of these conversations. Uh, I think what parents so often want to know is, yeah. is this okay? And is there a path forward? Yeah. And one of my very favorite interviews in the book, in the diagnosis chapter is with Dr. Brian Scottco, who's um, a Harvard professor, clinician and geneticist out of, um, uh, UMass General and runs their Down syndrome clinic mm -hmm. and has spent years researching how to deliver a diagnosis. Mm. And you know, there are bullet points and those are in the book. And it's really about delivering the information and taking the cues from the people who are receiving the information mm. because a family might be bereft and beside themselves and this is terrible take that with them from there. A family might be relieved. We have actually yes. been relieved with a number of our diagnoses because it is validation. Yep. Yep. Diagnosis, as you know, can be a path to answers, services, and yep. insurance coverage. Yes, and that's correct. State funding and support. So I, I really wish that all clinicians were delivering here is information and there is a path forward mm -hmm. and that can look different for each family diagnosis certainly each state yes. like what a mess it is from one state to the next yeah we're in different states i know and it is a different conversation of what precisely is available and my great hope is that this book will basically be the alternative to go home, Google and cry. See ya. Because that's all we do. We all just, we go home, we Google <laughs> and cry. If you don't have a podcast, that's the title. Right? Or at least, or at least of a popular episode. Go yes. home, Google and cry. Right? That that's is very what we yeah. all do. That's such a and, good Yeah. And the reality is... My kid's personality isn't hard. It is not tragic. He's hilarious. Um, mm. Seizures stink. I wish we could get rid yeah. of epilepsy for everybody. Um, there's stuff that is hard. Um, but when we can name the hard stuff and we can name that we are not trying to, quote unquote, fix our kid. And maybe if I just therapy him enough, he'll be not so disabled anymore. Like, yeah. no, he's real disabled. And that's cool. That's not a dig on him. That's just part of who he is. Yes. Um, yep. But we can look at 
there are supports available for you as a parent, for you as a caregiver. You can connect with other caregivers. You can connect with local organizations. Every state has a parent training and information center. Mm -hmm. And if you Google parent training and information center, you can pull up a locator, find out who's in your state. They're generally staffed by fellow parents on this journey who can put you on a path that is so much faster than mm -hmm. the Googling and crying that I did for years. Because all I was told was, I don't know how you're going to do this. Oh, my gosh. This is so terrible. I am so sorry. Mm. And I'm like, and usually, like, it started when our son was a tiny baby. He got his first mm. diagnosis at two and a half months old. And I'm like, can somebody just tell me my baby has amazing hair? Because he does. <laughs> he kind of had your hair, but like his baby <laughs> and without any product. So oh, there you go. That's hilarious. Yeah. That's good. Um, I had a quick a question um, of the all the subspecialists that you've met with and providers. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's been many. Um, what's what is one thing that surprised you about? Because I find sometimes when people, you know, as a developmental pediatrician and I'm also a geneticist, it there's a long, you know, people wait a long time to see us and oftentimes they come with a set of expectations and, you know, you want to try and meet those, but what, you know, what, what surprised you about what the medical community understands and, or doesn't understand about some of the things that you're writing about in this book? Mm -hmm. I think what has surprised me is finding the right clinician doesn't always mean the person with the answer. And a geneticist, you know this in spades, genetics are, you know, in our experience, kind of the Wild West. We've yes. done every genetic test that science has available. Our son is part of the Undiagnosed Diseases Network, which is remarkable. He has done everything up through yep. full genome sequencing, and yep. many of his genes have been tested multiple times. Hmm. Um, it's hard to not have an answer, but the clinicians who are smart and bold and confident enough to say, I don't have all the answers, but I am willing to walk this path with you mm -hmm. to make the discoveries, to be curious, are often the best clinicians for us mm -hmm. because that curiosity leads the clinicians to listen, to put things together that I'm not going to put together because I don't have medical training and expertise. Um, one of the conversations that I love for the book is with our um, neuro-ophthalmologist, who was the first specialist that Aaron saw and delivered us our first diagnosis of cortical vision impairments, um, that he talked about, and when I was interviewing him for the book, not just what makes a great parent to work with, but also which ones are the most challenging. Because <laughs> I was like, that's actually what we need to know. Ooh. Right? Yep. Mm -hmm. yes. Because yes. I, I believe our clinicians will deliver care for our children, period. That is why they do this. But we are all humans, and there are people we like dealing with, and there are people we do not like dealing with. Mm -hmm. Our children will still get the care, but the depth of the relationship can absolutely mean better and different and more effective care for our children. And what has surprised me is the degree to which, frankly, from parents more so than from clinicians, parents and friends, and I'm sure I've done this before too, come in with an expectation of how this visit will go, what the outcome will be, what mm -hmm. the resolution and the steps forward are, and that's what it is, right. that we are not engaging with and listening to our clinicians. And that's not the goal to come in and have yourself validated. The mm -hmm. goal is to say, I have an expert in front of me I am the expert in my child's day to day. My clinician does not live in my house. That'd be real weird. My husband's not a doctor either. Mm. 
my clinician is not seeing the day to day. And I, as a parent, need to be confident in my expertise on my child's day to day and confident in my clinician's expertise. They have seen many more children. They've yeah. attended way more medical school and they can drive this forward much better if I am willing to partner with them rather than bulldoze through. Sometimes that's hard to do. Most of us parents are feeling inadequate. We are underslept. We are overburdened with mountains of paperwork. Yeah. And we just want to go love our kids. Yeah. And I think it has surprised me just how many parents, frankly, are not um, not willing to equally partner with clinicians. Yeah. Um, and overwhelmingly, our clinicians have been um, humans as well as doctors and have walked this path with us. Um, at first, it surprised me to hear how often people were saying we don't have the answers. Hmm. I really wanted those answers. I would still love some answers. Yep. Um, yep. But the reality is, and I was like, oh, they were right every single time, mm. is when clinicians say we are doing all the things and we are waiting for your child to show us the next mm. step. Yeah. It is a great example. Um, we were told very early on when he was months old um, by the first neurologist we saw um, that we didn't know if Aaron would ever see or smile or hold up his own head. Hmm. It's hard to hear. Also, yeah. I'm underslept and have a toddler and I'm like, I've been yeah. eating Nutella for three days. I am not ready for this. <clears throat> yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> No, I just caught. I just caught what you did. You just say you'd been eating Nutella for three days. Yes. Like it's in a jar. You may or may not need a spoon. I don't know if it's supposed to go in the refrigerator, but like, yeah, oh, you know, lunch. Yeah, here's what I'll tell. You, here's what I'll tell you about that. Um, I get in our clinic, as you can guess, we get a lot of people who have come from clinics where that those types of things have been said. Mm -hmm. Whether it's from, and this is not a knock on any specialties, yeah. but there are certain specialties that lend themselves to prognostication yeah. and based on imaging studies or NICU mm -hmm. course or whatever it is, or genetic condition. And, you know, one of the things that I have found in our practice is that no one has ever come back to my clinic asking for a refund on hope. No one has ever said to me, hey, Noble, remember when you said that you believe that my kid was going to be uh, as independent as possible, that they're going to walk and talk if if that's in the cards and if we, if they if they have the abilities and that that's the way that things move, then we're going to get them to that place. I mean, overall, at the end of the day, our goal is to squeeze every drop of potential out of the life of a child. That doesn't mean that every kid's going to end up at the same spot. It's, okay. it's, it's not that... Um, Every kid, if you therapize them enough, they're going to end up, you know, doing X, Y, and Z. That's not what we mean to say. But being able to cast a vision for the future of, of, yeah. of folks as best we're able. Sometimes we overshoot it sometimes, but we never undershoot it. That's one thing yeah. we never do. Because yeah. no one comes back angry with like a half-smoking Virginia Slim and a beer. <laughs> you know what I mean? Half of their face is covered in Nutella saying, get Noble out here. I want a refund on him believing in our kids. <laughs> You know, if that ever happens, please send me a picture. That would be phenomenal. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. <laughs> but it's, I mean, it's just it's, to your point. Well, and, and we're not, and again, this came from my interview with Dr. Borchard, our neuro-ophthalmologist, yeah. that we're not giving up on hope. We are giving up on preconceptions. Yeah, sure. And man, I had a whole lot of preconception of what my kid's life would look like, what my life, what all the things yep. would look like. I didn't think I'd be diapering at 10 years old, but there you have it. Um, does that mean I'm hopeless? No, it just means I need to order wipes. Yep. Um, looking at our own preconceptions can be really hard. Um, mm. If you had told me, 
Oh, here I go. I'm gonna cry. I'm a crier, so like I'm totally gonna yeah. cry. Um, if you had, if that doctor who very rightly, we didn't know it when our kid was three months old, if he would ever see or smile or mm -hmm. hold up his own head. If oh, here I go. If I had known a decade later who my child would be, mm -hmm. that would have changed everything. He is vibrant. Mm -hmm. He is walking and not walking like everybody else. Walking is not always the goal, yep. but he's vibrant. He's walking. He has, as you said, opinions and wants and needs. He is able to express them. We might not have a verbal conversation, but this morning he was reading a book and that when the tiger missed his friends, he said on his device, book sad. <laughs> and I was like, buddy, that is sad. He's got a he's got a higher social IQ than a lot of adults I know. That's yeah. Impressive. And like we have all these preconceptions and being disabled is harder than not. Mm -hmm. You know where that information comes from? Disabled adult friends over and over. Mm -hmm. And if the world was built for my son, it wouldn't be so hard. But the reality is, yeah. it's not built for him. People do stare. People, fortunately, yeah. don't make that many weird comments. Yeah. Um, but if things were more accessible, this would be easier. The reality is that they're not. By having our kids be fully themselves mm -hmm. out in the community, yeah. That allows everyone to see the full representation of disability. And we choose to not apologize when our kid isn't doing anything wrong. If our oh. kids are doing things they shouldn't be doing, like yeah. they'll apologize, we'll apologize, cool. But when my kid is like squealing loudly and dancing and applauding for the lettuces at Trader Joe's. Yes. Like it is noisy. It is not the shopping experience anybody else here is expecting. Uh -huh. Also, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, yeah, I like that. I like that you, I like how you say that. Don't go out of your way to make an apology when there's no apology that's needed. Right. I mean, I, I, I love it. Yeah, and we used to, and we realized, wait a second. Wait a second. Our kid is moving through life hearing me apologize for who he is. Whoa, we got to stop that. And it took a lot of effort instead of saying, oh my gosh, is he taking up the whole aisle in Costco because he's dancing? Instead of saying, I'm so sorry, say thank you for understanding. Yeah. I'm not saying, oh, he's disabled. So, you know, that's a bummer. Uh, no, because his disability uh -huh. is not an apology. His existence yeah. is not an apology. But when you say thank you for understanding, like it's gonna take a real jerk to be like, I don't understand. Like, <laughs> No, he and his service dog sometimes are going to be in the way of you buying your bulk pallet of beans. And yeah. you know what? Yeah. Just be here for a sec and then we'll go dance somewhere else. Cool. Uh, okay. Okay. All right. Here's another. I have another quite, I have a bunch of questions, but right. let me, let me see. Cause I, this kind of touches on that. So you have two children, right? Aaron, who we've talked about, um, but you have another child, um, who is is not disabled mm -hmm. can you can you tell us a little bit because i mean that's not an uncommon scenario mm -hmm. um, i see that a lot in families and so oftentimes families um struggle sometimes with the tension of mm -hmm. um, and i'm not saying this is the right perspective but this yeah. is where their struggles tend to be yeah. they're spending a lot of time energy and resources mm -hmm. you know a speech therapy waiting room or in a GI clinic somewhere. And, yep. you know, maybe there's a tag along sibling or maybe someone's having a, you know, a difficult day or a frustrating moment um, where, you know, maybe it's, I don't know, we're just, we're not in a good spot and we're at Applebee's yep. or whatever. And you're just like, oh boy. Um, my, uh, my oldest son has Tourette syndrome and mm -hmm. he's got, um, it's at times can be pretty, pretty severe. And I see yeah. it with my other, I have four kids. Mm -hmm. I see it with some of my other kids. They just, you know, they get to this spot where you're, it's, it's, um, it's hard. It's hard for them. It's hard yes. to, you know, have people record you in a, in an airport and then have to be like, why are you, he has, this is, so now I have to have this conversation with you about how that's not okay. Cause he's got a, oh. thing. I mean, I'm just, and you know, and it's, 
I see that on my kids' faces sometimes. How do you, how do you, can you speak to that um, and, and t teach us a little bit about how you, how you handle that? Yes. And I love that you can engage in this conversation as well. It would be great, as with all things, if there was one way to ensure that all the siblings are going to be good. You know what? Our kids will probably all be in therapy for something. So <laughs> welcome to the club. Yeah. Um, the sibling piece is challenging. It can look so different in each family and maybe from one day or week or month or year to the next. Yeah. Being open and comfortable with all conversations about disability, about family dynamic, and allowing kids to feel however they feel mm -hmm. is so essential. Mm -hmm. In my chapter on what this looks like for you as a parent caregiver, um, sibling stuff can be and might be its own book because it is so complex. I interviewed an expert who is himself an adult sibling of his sister, who's also an adult who is mm -hmm. disabled and has spent his career digging into these things. And it is so necessary to validate your kids' feelings mm -hmm. and not tell them how they need to feel about this and to emphasize the time and effort that I'm putting into your brother. My older son, Sean, is not disabled. My younger son, Aaron, is. Say, Sean, if that is what you needed, we would do that for you. And mm -hmm. he, I believe he deeply understands that. And he happens to be a kid who is a kind of remarkably confident 12-year-old mm -hmm. who is okay with the staring and the weirdness and all the stuff and has his quippy comebacks to everything. Some kids aren't, some kids will internalize that some kids right. will not be psyched that their sibling is disabled. And we just need to start with validating that mm -hmm. having things where the disabled sibling is not the center of the universe. Mm -hmm. If your family yeah. is into baseball, and the disability present, prevents you from ever going to baseball games, that's going to create some tension. How no. can you create things that are the center of your family that give you something to have in common to bond over that aren't just disability is the sun in our solar system and we are mm -hmm. all just revolving around that. Yeah. You know what? There are times and seasons where we're in and out of the hospital and it does revolve around that. Yeah. But knowing that we have other touchstones to come back to as a family helps to build in for all of our kids, including our disabled kids, that our family is, this is a part of our family, is an important part of our family, but it is not everything in our family. Yep. Yep. And that can help to build the communication, the trust, the bonds, all these things that we want to have with all of our kids. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's good. So it's a tension. There's some balance. I like how you say, look, you know, if this is what you needed, we do it for you, my man. But it's, that's not, this is where we're at. It's kind of, kind of, yes. okay. All yeah. Right. When, our, when our 12 year old has a band concert, you know, we are going to go see you play your tuba and we're going to move whatever mountains we need. Cause by the way, seeing your 12 year old play the tuba is awesome. Yeah. Um, kind of random. Um, <laughs> But keep in conversation always. Yeah, just kind of touch points and getting yeah. in there and asking the questions. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Um, what advice do you have for parents just starting out on this journey? I mean, what? There's probably a lot of things you can say here. You know, what? Um, what do you most want people to know as they get going on this? Whenever I talk to parents, the first thing as I say is, "How are you actually doing?" Yeah. However you are doing, be honest with yourself and start from there. It is okay to admit that you are feeling scared, overwhelmed, anxious, depressed, whatever the thing is. Uh, the National Institutes of Health has a recent study talking about this parent population. I think it was 66% of dads and 94% of moms. Mm. 
of disabled children experience depression and or yeah. anxiety. Oh, absolutely. And when I saw that, I thought, hmm, those numbers sound low. Even the 94%, that sounds mm. low. Mm. However you are feeling now, you will feel better. Mm. Validate where you are. It's not just about have a different mindset. Mm. Acknowledge that things have shifted. And the path between where you're feeling now to, I got this, we're good. Hmm. Very long time. Yeah. And the bridge there is getting to know your child as they are. Mm -hmm. And that does take a long time. The more that you can and the faster that you can connect with other parents hmm. who are similar situations, it yep. does not have to be the same disability. Yep. Some of my first and most important parent connections were yeah. parents of kids with Down syndrome. Yeah. That's one thing I know my kid doesn't have. But sharing community resources, yeah. ideas, experience. Yeah. Yes, yes. You, you yeah. might have to make new friends. Kind of weird, but also necessary. You, Next that's a good point because people will say, well, how many kids do you have in your clinic with this diagnosis? That's a pretty mm -hmm. common question that people ask. Mm -hmm. And I'll say is, you know, with, you know, you're doing whole exome, whole genome sequencing, you'll, I got one and I'm looking at them. Right. But then usually what I say to families is listen to your point about, you know, making families not with the, with the same diagnosis is listen, I may have one kid with this particular issue, but I've got thousands upon thousands with very similar strengths and weaknesses mm -hmm. Tend to think less in terms of diagnoses and more in terms of themes. What, yeah. what is this individual with these current skills in this community with this insurance and this kind of parental infrastructure with yeah. one car who took or who took a bus to get here? What is realistically the next step for that family or individual? Yes. I can talk to you about that. But yes. the guy in Harvard has five people yes. with this. I've got yes. one. So and go see that guy or that lady and they'll be great. But I'm just letting you know, this is about yeah. themes. So you can yeah. learn stuff from the down community. You can learn stuff mm -hmm. from, so I love what you're saying. Yes. And also this is of the many things I love about geneticists who have been essential in our journey is I find that geneticists do exactly what you just described is looking for themes and looking yeah. for connections yep. and have this big picture able to helicopter up view and see yeah. all of the things and connections and yep. a huge connection that we all have is we are all caregivers. Yeah. And yeah. that's why connecting with other caregivers matters mm. because there will be so much overlap. I saw a friend this morning, her daughter has autism, anxiety, and other learning disabilities. My son's presentation, diagnosis, way he moves through the world is wildly different. Her daughter, who at age 12 just received a diagnosis, mm -hmm. my child started many years ago. Mm -hmm. We are able to compare notes in a way that is so valuable to both of us. And man, it feels good to just listen to other parents yeah. and the rare disease community is so strong. And there are so many amazing parents that even just starting by connecting with the rare disease community yeah. can make your life so much easier and save you so much time and money and stress. Mm. That's a good word. How about this one? Now we could talk for a long time. But I, I need to get this information out there for people. How do we find you and in turn order 1 million copies? Yes. Of, well, where do we find you? Yes. In addition to finding us dancing at the lettuce at Trader Joe's, yes. um, kellycoleman.com is there my go. website. There you go. Look it's at, Look at that website. Incredible. Um, You're underwater here. Oh, I mean, you want to talk about AI. That right? is, what was that? You want to talk about, you just said this is not AI. This no. is you going deep. That is me. My <laughs> laptop died and I was like, cool, photo prop. We're going to try and recover those files. Then we're going for a swim. Oh. Um, that's actually me because there's our metaphor. 
Yeah. We might be underwater, uh -huh. but we still have to figure out how to do all the things. Yep. And man, we can make this easier on each other. Uh, uh, my sure. website, kellycoleman.com, K-E-L-L-E-Y, Coleman. Yep. Yep. And the website has plenty of links to order the book. Um, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Target, your local bookseller. Um, please order 1 million copies, not just yep. for yourself, but for your clinician, for your school's parent center, for your local library. My goal is to get this book into the hands of everyone. Most importantly, we need to get this into the library so that people who cannot afford to buy a book mm -hmm. have this information. Mm -hmm. I check a lot of demographic boxes that mean my kid gets more of the supports and services he needs. And that's not okay. All of our children need equal access to the supports and services. So if we can get this into libraries, it changes the game for everyone. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, this has been, I, 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 want, I don't want to say surprising because I knew just by the materials in the book that this was going to be awesome. But sometimes, you know, you just, you never, <laughs> just never know. Yeah. I, am I going to say the wrong thing and now they're going to be super mad at me? You know, are they, do they see the medical community as bad and wrong and terrible? I mean, it's just, it's an, it's a weird time to be a doctor. It's just a really weird time to be a doctor. And so I thank you for your, for being gracious and articulate and fantastic and the ferocious advocate that you are. This has been, this has been really, really great. I've learned a lot of stuff is now, listen, before we close, is there any question I should have asked you that I didn't? Uh, well, you did ask me if the photos were real, so that's important. <laughs> and I think the most important question is parents, where do they start? Yep. Right now, they're like, I, I want to do something right to figure this out. Mm -hmm. It will cost you no money and almost no time to go online, go on social media and follow organizations that are run by and support people with disabilities mm -hmm. to follow leaders and creators who are disabled themselves. Mm -hmm. As soon as you do that, this starts to feel better and different. Mm -hmm because we are learning from real people with real experience. And that is everything. Mm. That's a good word. Kelly Coleman. All right, boss. Let me know if you're ever in town. If you're ever in the Midwest on a book tour, please let me know so I can come get a signed copy. Okay? 100%. I am excited to support you and your work any way I can. Thank you for All doing right. this.